What's happening? What's happening? What's happening, blues people? I think it's time for us to rap. I should have been able to actually give this a um, title when I shared it. I don't see the title. I'm going to pull up Facebook on my phone just to make sure everything is copacetic because we're going to talk about a couple of things. I just wanted to see where we're at with it here. And if that you guys could um, stay with me. Can you dig it? All right. We're good money. All right, let's go check something out here. Who's that? Happy holidays, my brother. Um, so the name of this, we're going to call this Ma Rainey, August Wilson, Black Folk Narrative and Ethnography. What's happening, Brother Court? We're going to call it that because there's a couple of things here that I would like to discuss, especially after seeing the film uh, Ma Rainey uh, Black Bottom, right, with Viola Davis, uh, with Chadwick, and all the great uh, actors that took part in it. Um, I'm sure that we all know this is a August, based off of August Wilson play, and I think I'll jump in right there. I just have to say, for me, August Wilson has to be by far the most brilliant, if not one of the most brilliant, um, folk narrative, black folk narrative, and ethnograph ethnographic writers of our time based on what his content uh, 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 transmits when it comes to African American traditional music as it reflects the black experience in America. And that's, again, that's one of the main reasons why Jack Dapper Blue's heritage preservation is extremely important, why the African American Folklorist newspaper is extremely important, and other uh, platforms that, um, that, that do folkloric and ethnographic work are really important because I've been listening to a lot of and I've been reading a lot of people's responses to the movie that recently um, premiered on Netflix. And I heard a couple of people say that they always knew of Bessie Smith. Um, they remember the Bessie Smith movie, um, but they were not aware of the role Ma Rainey played outside of the Bess Bessie Smith movie. Um, or whatever little bit that they understand. And then they go on to, you know, there's a couple of people. They go on to blame the white educational system um, in regards to them filtering things out or giving us the narrative or whatever the case it is. Um, I, I have to say, first and foremost, I, I do not, 100% agree with that. Let's just start right there uh, for several reasons. One, in a day of inf uh, information readily available at your fingertips, you, we should not be in a place where we're still blaming folk for things we don't, we weren't taught or don't know. All right, that's number one. Number two, there was a group of black folk throughout throughout the time, but let's just talk about the 1800s through the turn of the century, that similar to Constantine's group of folk who omitted some Bible verses and put in some Bible verses based on what their agenda was, there was a group of black folk that filtered information in and out because we, ha and, and this is the main point we have to remember. At this time, during the um, Ma Rainey uh, movie, this era, from the late 1800s throughout the uh, 1940s for that matter, even up until hip hop, blues music 
was not revered the way it is now. That was something back then that was first and foremost, just on a spiritual level, that was secular. For church folk, that was devil music. Now, now, right now, what we're discussing is very surface stuff. And for those who don't know, I hope I didn't offend you by saying this is surface stuff, but I just want to go through this real quick. So just off the top, for church people, this was considered devil's music. And this goes way back to slave seculars, right? Secondly, for a lot of, not all, but a lot of educated folks, those who were in the academic space that were black, African-American, black Indian, whatever you, you, you uh, identified with at the time, this was what we can consider below the belt. The music was not, the music, the performance, the performances, the antics with the performances, it was frowned upon by those who were in, I guess, high city society. I don't even want to say that for too much because it was, it was just, it, it was not looked at in high regard. A lot of this music, a lot of the performances. We also have to remember that there was many names for this. Now, Ma Rainey and her circuit, vaudeville, right? At the same time, not only vaudeville, it was also um, considered, it was, it, was, it was a step away from minstrel, right? Not specifically what she was doing or, or the, the women like um, uh, Ethel Ward, Isaiah Cox, and, and, and Victoria uh, 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 Spivey. I'm not saying they were uh, uh, engaging in minstrelsy. What I'm saying is th this was the space for black folk to to make money as entertainers, right? And that there were groups of black folk who didn't subscribe to that. They didn't want to subscribe to anything that reminded them of the blackness that was under attack or, or of, of the backwood or the deep south where a lot of these expressions, if not were created, galvanized. You know, so there, there's a lot to unpack here, okay? And and our job, my job, is to try to 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 give you the proper context because what happens is we get one version of the story from um, enthusiasts, uh, from from purists, uh, from from early European and and, and white. Uh, academics and we get one version of the story and and kind of regurgitate that one story over and over and 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 lose the rest of the story which is why Jack Dapper Blues and the African American folklorist is really important and with that being said there's a few things we want to unpack the, the, the first thing is again Ma Rainey had been performing in the 1800s, right? I hear someone say, you know, she was the first, but I think there was others. There was a lot. I mean, W.C. Handy, uh, Perry Bradford, uh, Clara Smith, I believe I already mentioned her, Mary Stratford, Ethel Waters, Alberta Hunter. There, there, there was uh, um, um, Henry Thomas. There were so many people, uh, and I'm not even, I, I'm so, there's a lot that I'm, that's escaping me right now that was performing. So now, when we get to the movie, the August Wilson play, the story of this great ethnographer who always utilizes the blues people expression to tell his stories. Viola Davis had a monologue, and I'm not going to talk about the aesthetics in regards to filmmaking and things like this. Viola Davis had a monologue that I found that was very intriguing and, and it really hit home when she explained that they're only going to treat me nice until they get my voice on this machine because obviously this was a new concept at that time. And we can thank Perry Bradford as well as W.C. Handy uh, in the early 1900s 
when when Perry Bradford first and foremost ran around trying to uh, uh, galvanize record labels, trying to explain to them that black folk buy music and they will buy these records and, and no one really wanted to hear it. He finally was able to speak, talk someone into doing a recording uh, of Mamie Smith, which um, and it resulted in Crazy Blues, which was the first out. She's the first black woman, first, first black woman to record a record. And she went platinum. And in the first month, sold 75,000 units. And this is what kind of launched um, what they call race records at the time, black music. Right, they had Black Swan and a whole bunch of things, OK Records, all these others, and things of this nature. Right, so when she says this, she's talking about something that we, we have to unpack, so to speak. Because as she makes this statement, she keeps telling the label owners, I don't need this. I can go back and do my shows and get paid. So what happens is we're seeing the beginnings of exploitation of black expression, which filters into the folklore uh, field because then we see um, folklorists, uh, academics, or even failed music executives going into the South, uh, tracking people down, doing their version of American Idol in local bars and having uh, local musicians come in and, and uh, uh, audition them and then put them on record and maybe give them a couple of dollars and now they own these people's intellectual property voice and everything up until this point. Right, so that's something that we should unpack. There's something else that we should unpack that I find extremely important. Um, and as I go into this, I, 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 well, first, the fact that, again, those who are enthusiasts and those who are purists, and I have to say, I, at one time, I was a purist. I, I may still be a purist, right? But those who are purists have one uh, a tunnel vision of what they believe the blues is, what they believe the blues was, and how they believe the blues should be and how the blues should sound. Now, you guys may remember I did an uh, interview with Chris Thomas King on his um, open letter about how he was um, snubbed in the blues section of the uh, Grammys, and some people had issues with that, but you should go back and listen to that because that also plays into what I'm about to discuss in regards to this movie. And it's not a bad thing. What I'm saying is it's something that they brought to the forefront that I, don't, I believe a lot of people, from what I was seeing and hearing, uh, either didn't receive, slipped by them, or other things may have just been more prevalent or important to them. But to me, this is very important in dissecting, understanding, and translating the blues, the blues people. The conflict between Levy and Ma Rainey, and we see this over and over and over again when it comes to many versions and generations of black expression. I mean, for that matter, possibly any other um, um, cultural expression too, but I'm going to specifically talk about blues people culture. And I don't usually hear people speaking about this. Now, John Wesley Work spoke about this. All of them, John Wesley Work, one, two, and the third, because they were all ethnographers, uh, folklorists, as well as his mother, grandfather, uncle, and they also played a, a, a prominent role in the Fisk Jubilee Singers' inception and throughout the years. They were also uh, uh, composers. John Wesley Works believed, the third believed that black music progresses. It doesn't, de it doesn't devalue, it doesn't go backwards, it doesn't stay stagnant, it progresses. 
I, I had the honor to interview Guy Davis, who makes the same claim. I, have the on, I had the honor to interview Corey Harris, who made the same claim. So what am I getting to? Those who revere the blues to the point that they're such a purist that in their belief system or their construct, the blues is just this one version of expression you know the the hobo just for example it's like the hobo with the guitar right going up and down the train tracks this this is a, a, a overused uh image of blues is and that's it's not that's not fact right they're Ma Rainey and, 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 well, Levi, let's, let's say Levy specifically, because it wasn't just with her. He was arguing with the other bandmates about how the music should sound now. Not that he had an issue with the music of before, but the music of before is, you know, is, is, is to him, it's a new day. And we should take that and apply it to the new sound black folk are expressing and dancing to. And, and this is, to me, very important because, and I think it gets lost in the source of a lot of, of, of enthusiasts, purists, and audience. Um, the concept of the evolution of black music is extremely evident. It's evident within the musicians it's evident within the culture. Uh, it's evident within black historians, right? Chris Thomas King again explained where the blues comes from. In in in, I would say in his mind, I agree with him, but this is his 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 concept, it's, it's, and what the meaning of the word blue was, blues, why it was used, and that it wasn't downtrodden music, right? Which all of blues is not downtrodden music because if it was, then you're actually saying blues people are not only monolithic, but only have one emotional expression. It is a response to a system. It is a response to experiences. It is a response to specifically an American experience, a black American experience, right? But that response comes in many, in, 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 in a variety of ways, happy, sad, whatever the case may be. And with those different emotions and nuances comes with uh, a variance of musical expression. And I think we, we do a disservice if we don't qualify, quantify, or examine the fact that black expression evolves at this point, maybe even at a more rapid pace than ever, right? We can even just look at hip hop from 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 uh, Grandmaster Cass, Curtis Blow to KRS One to Ch and Chuck D to Biggie, Jay Z to 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 Fifty to to now um, uh, J Cole and a lot of young brothers and sisters that I I have to be honest, I'm not fully familiar with a lot of these young folk, but their music does represent the generational space they're in now with elements of before. So I, I say all this to say that that moment, that, that well, not even that moment, the, the entire thread was through the, throughout this, 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 this film. And they were, he kept saying, this is what people want to hear now. They want to hear that old uh, jug band music is what he called it, right? He called it jug band music, which I found quite ironic um, that he specified all of Ma Rainey's music as jug band, you know. Um, not to mention, you should uh, listen to my podcast with Michael Jones, uh, a Kentucky historian, period, but a Kentucky music historian as well. And he gives the history of jug band and how... Uh, in, in how Kentucky is instrumental in a lot of black expression in the early days, right? So what, what, why do I keep repeating this? Because we, we have to understand 
when we're discussing the expression of black folk, when we're discussing the blues in particular, uh, black spirituals, gospel, ragtime, all of these things, um, we have to uh, we, we have to understand, even though the way it is expressed is uh, evolves every generation or two doesn't mean that it's no longer viable as blues no longer viable as 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 even jazz right no longer viable as uh jug music for that matter no longer viable as hip hop along with understanding its evolution doesn't omit the people it came from and the people it belongs to, right? We have to drive that home. Never have I said or am I saying non-blues people cannot play blues. Never have I said or am saying um, that people outside of the culture cannot partake in the culture and learn the culture. But what I'm saying is as music, as expression evolves it doesn't mean that the people left it behind it doesn't mean that the people omitted it it doesn't mean that the people um you know disrespected it what you know and just threw it away what it means is they they created a new way to express the tradition now you can muddy waters is a great example you got to, you know, you, you you go from being in a rural environment with an acoustic instrument into an urban environment with more people up on top of each other, and you you electrify. You know, and he he played he played country blues on an electric instrument. I mean, amongst other things, the dude was great, but he evolved the music, the expression. It was still the blues. You know what I'm saying? It it was still the blues. So, Brother Walter, what's happening? It was still the blues nonetheless. So when, when, when these expressions evolve, it does not mean the people, it does not mean, it does not mean the people, sorry guys, I'm getting a phone call. <laughs> it does not mean that the people relinquished it, gave it up. Right, and let's also talk about what they used to call these women of the blues. Right, they called uh, classic blues, right? Because they, you know, I guess categorizing things uh, maybe helps to sell in a commercial sense. Maybe helps catalog it in an archival sense and different things of this nature. But we, we, I'm going to read you off the definition. Classic blues was an early form of blues music popular in the 1920s, an amalgam of traditional folk blues and urban theater music. This style is also known as vaudeville blues. Classic blues were performed by female singers accompanied by pianists or small jazz ensembles and were the first blues to be recorded. There's um a, 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 quite a few holes to a degree. Good general statement. Um, the the idea that they say these are jazz bands first and foremost is not um is not correct. I'm trying to think of the brother's name. Um, geez, from New Orleans, he was a blues. He, he well, he was a blues musician. On, on, on trumpet, one of the earliest and the first. I think his name was Bolton. I think his name was Bolton. These folk knew that they were playing the blues. It was never a question about what they were playing. The, and I said this before, the term jazz derives from a blues band from New Orleans that was called J-A-S-S, -S, right? So now, when they discuss classic blues, they also omit, for me, one of the most prominent uh, foremothers of blues music, uh, music in general, which is uh, Memphis Minnie. Uh, I think 
the only person that may have <clears throat> a a catalog as extensive as Memphis Mini is Petey Wheatstraw, or as as uh, one of my brothers told me, um, Tampa Red and Lonnie Johnson, right? And we also know that Memphis Mini uh, recorded alone with with uh, 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 Kansas Joe and with bands, right? So some of these mantras, some of these, not even mantras, some of these definitions um, don't give the full uh, uh, trajectory of what this stuff is. But going back to the film, those are the two things I really wanted to discuss in regards to her understanding her space. And she wasn't the only one. Understanding that once they got her voice, And the question, now the question remains, did was she getting residuals? A lot of times, you know, there's a story of Lightning Hopkins where he was just giving $2,000 cash to, to, to play a couple of songs. They, you know, and, and, and the people who recorded it and pressed it and distributed it uh, on the licensing, right? So this changed, this changed not only, uh, well, it changed the music business. It changed how these folks got paid. Um, some people blame Perry Bradford and W.C. Handy uh, f for the business model that ultimately robbed a lot of these folk for, for, for their publishing. But... You know, at the same time, that's 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 a catch twenty two because those cats got their publishing, and it goes back to my earlier statement about blaming a white educational system for not knowing your own history. You know, at some point, we we have to do our due diligence and and research. Now, I'm now you know you don't have to take all the answers from me. Hopefully, what what I work to do is lay it out for you uh through, whether it's through content uh or the interviews or the newspaper or what have you or things like this then you take it and you go research it and 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 you you verify or come to your own conclusion whatever but you need to find it out because you know my rainy and it's really ironic because my rainy was um, a big to do for lack of a better term, before the record record industry, before, you know, just strictly off these live performances and going all these places, I found a lot of um, news clippings uh, from the 1920s and early 1900s, 19-teens uh, of Ma Rainey, right? I'll, po I'll post some of those later. I've also found some of them. Um, Henry Thomas, who you can go back and listen to that podcast as well, because you 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 want to get a sense to understand. And then it is another thing. In this, um, I don't want to say conflict, right? But in this forever a uh, 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 running situation of black music progressing, right? Oh, thank you, Max. No problem. In this ever, you know, uh, never-ending progression of black expression, we also have to re remember that even in the early days of the 16th, 17th, and 1800s, uh, particular black musicians of the community were the holder of the scroll, or as some say the griot, or, or the folklorist of, of the actual uh, community, where they knew the songs and the stories and the dances and the games of old, and, and they presented it and taught it to those in, in, in current time. And we need those folk. We need people like that because as our expression evolves, someone has to 
also keep the old traditions uh, prevalent. And what what happens is in in that space because a lot of those a lot of people in that space aren't necessarily looking at it as a as a commercial vehicle. Other people hijack it and and commercialize it, make a huge you know profit off it, and we get like the Beatles, and then you know it's like. 30, 40, 50 years later, it comes back around and everyone's like, oh man, I, I didn't know that was a Muddy Waters song or I didn't know that was a this or that was a that. And we can't continue to blame the system that is built on exploitation of black expression, of Dutch expression, of native expression, et cetera, et cetera. We, we have to revere those folklorists and ethnographers and musicians. Like um, you can go back and check um, another podcast that I did, Elijah Cox, who is considered, I consider ethnographer and a folklorist. He was actually a free black man, fought in the uh, Revolutionary War. Was it the Revolutionary War? The Civil War, excuse me. Fought in the Civil War. He was stationed in, in Texas. And where he was stationed, he learned songs of slave times from former slaves. So then he was able to bring carry those songs across the turn of the century, carry those traditions across the turn of the century. Apache Brown was happening. Matter of fact, Apache Brown is a perfect example. We did a, um, a festival this Saturday, and his uh, 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 set is a perfect example of what I'm, I'm discussing because you have the element of the traditional music, but you feel and see the evolution of the music because the expression doesn't say, stay in the same place in one place. J.B. Hendrix is a great example of that, right? Going back to what I was saying, uh, there's Bessie Jones, which look out for that project. It's coming up soon. I'm going to cover her in full detail. Um, Bessie Jones, a, a black spiritual singer, a folk game um uh I guess you could say hold on the scroll scroll because what she did was she she the songs of old in, in the gullah and in, in places of this nature she she sang them the games that the kids played she taught them you know these things are important and they kind of go hand in hand so I guess well I don't guess what I'm explaining to you is in revering the old, we still have to acknowledge the evolved. With the old, the folklorists and the ethnographers and the and the people like the Henry Thomas and 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 the the Elijah Cox and, and folks like this, who well, I can speak about people in today's world like Piedmont Blues right or Dom Fleming who who take those songs of many years ago and carry them to the now you you have to support these folk right at the same token the the Marquis Knox the Kingfishers you know as they evolve the and there's so many so if I don't name everybody you know give me a break because <laughs> there's just so many but you know we as they evolve the music you, you, you must understand the people never left the music or the expression, and the expression never left the people. It just evolved, right? So I, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a country blues cat, right? Acoustic, national, slide, and even when I was in New York City, whether I was in the Bronx, Harlem, or Brooklyn, I sat on the steps as if I was sitting on the back porch, but I grew up in the concrete, right? Otis Taylor, exactly. Oh, exactly. Otis Taylor is a great example. So the point I'm making is, you you know, stories change, environments change, which evolves the expression, but it's still the expression of the people. And then on to another thing, talking about August Wilson as a folk narrative connoisseur as as an ethnographer we also have to remember literature is a big part of 
not just blues people, but blues expression. James Baldwin, who's becoming, you know, the last few people I, I had the pleasure of discussing James Baldwin with, we've all noticed that he's becoming more popular now than he has in a while, but the majority of us always knew about the depth of this brother and his foresight. He was blues people. His, 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 his I think I got him sitting right here, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. He's been sitting right here. This brother, this is the blues. This that that is oh you can call it a cappella if you will, even though the rhythm of his words play out like music. Uh Sterling Brown, we already know Langston Hughes. And just as another example of of uh, ethnographer or folklorist who carries these musical traditions, everyone is is celebrating at this day and age Zora Neale Hurston, you know. And she she falls into the category of the Elijah Cox, right? Um, speaking of other writers, Richard Wright. These are these these folk wrote the story of the blues through na folk narrative. So it's all rel relative, and they all are in, are in the same space as the Honorable uh, August Wilson, right? who had a plethora of, he had Jitney Fences is one of my favorite, the play and the film, you know, I believe it won a Pulitzer, if I'm not mistaken, and a, and a Tony maybe, but again, academic books are great, and when I say academic books, like, like people who write books about the blues people in, in, in a textbook-like feel, that is great. Never disregard or omit that. And I'm definitely not doing that because as you can see, I use them myself. But along with that comes two things. The experience of the blues people, past and present, that's, that's transmitted from us in everyday conversation or even Facebook posts, right? Also, in these folk narratives by these great folk that I just mentioned, August Wilson, James Baldwin, Mil Mildred D. Taylor, you know, these are the names that's on the top of my head, so forgive me if you hear me repeating them over and over, and maybe it's good so that you guys can start looking into them. You know, there's so many others, Dunbar, you know, we can go through the list, but the blues narrative, which you should also go to the African American Folklore's website and start listening to the actual series the blues narrative first installment is up brother walter wesley the rest is coming blues narrative blues expression also lives in literature and if you really want to get um richard ellison is is, is also a great example a lot of people uh connect him to jazz more so but he clearly states that he's talking the blues and what the blues actually is and again he clearly states that because he understood that what people began to call jazz has always been the blues. But again, as we finish up, as we wrap up, to understand the blues people and the expression, it's not just through the music. That is a, a, a key transmission. But check out the narratives. Check out, like, like Ma Rainey. Um, again, I'm not going to get into the aesthetics, but the conflict that... Levy had as a as a younger cat with with a new cultural expression of our traditional music put up against an established woman and, and many people you gotta understand who she was. This this was she was serious business, right? She was very serious business. They didn't play. She didn't play, her people didn't play because you know you, you're dealing, see, again, and I have to go back to this because a, a lot of people have this nostalgia about juke joints and these places where vaudevilles, uh, theaters, and, 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 and um, shot houses and all these things, they, they, there's this nostalgia where it's like, oh, man, you know, I wish I was there. I want to go back there. No, you don't. Especially if you, you, you know, I know a couple of people that could go back there and be okay, you know, but we, we have to understand that the, 
a lot of which is why a lot of the church folk said it was devil's music, not because of the content, but what surrounded the performance, where the performances was happening, what was happening in these places that the performance was taking place. What you you know, the 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 drinks, the 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 drugs, you know, it's not it's nothing really new under the sun. We we saw this during during soul, we saw this during disco, we saw this during rap, we saw this during rock and roll. You know, so it, it's not a that's right, Brother Walter, right on. It, it, it's 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 no different. So when you understand what Ma Rainey and 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 I mean Geechee Wiley, all of them uh, Memphis many who it's 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 very well documented pack pistols you know when when you when you understand what they were dealing with then you understand you know why she was who she was you know and I'm gonna go into a little dangerous territory as a male because of everything that's going on right now but I just have to say it wasn't now and this is, you know what, and this is a perfect example of, of expression evolving. I, I, don't, I, I don't see Memphis Minnie, I don't see Ma Rainey subscribing to feminism or being a feminist. I, I, I see them subscribing to, I got to take care of me and mine, you know, at all costs because of the terrain. However, you know, I guess from the late 60s to now, there will be groups of women and men that would suggest she was in that space and that she was a foremother of a feminist movement. Are they right or wrong? That's not for me to say, but I will say I, I, I can almost guarantee that those women wouldn't identify as that. And the only reason why I say that is because of the reading. And again, it's again going full circle. The, the, the research and reading that I've done, um, I'm going to have to find it and ask. First, I'll ask permission before I post it. But I, I do remember uh, recently, within the last couple of months, I, I, I read a, a piece by a folklorist who uh, did a piece on her grandmother, grandparents, and, and, and great-grandparents and, and horse racing and things like this and what it was like in those times. And she interviewed her grandmother, and in that, after she transcribed it and wrote the piece, she presented it as her grandmother was was like a foremother of 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 feminism, and you know she was a strong woman standing up to to a patriarchal uh, 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 system and this that and the third, and her grandmother when she read it was livid. And said, "How don't don't connect me to this? I'm that has nothing to do with none of this, and, you know." And she went on and explained, you know. So please understand, I'm not denouncing anyone's uh, ideology. I'm just telling you based on data, as they say. Is I, I don't particularly believe that my Rainey would fall into that, or, or let me say, not fall into that, but subscribe to it. But if your data leads you to believe that she was a foremother of this particular ideology, I, you know, I, I dig it. I dig it. With that being said, again, sign up for the newspaper. Okay. Go check out those podcasts I spoke to you guys about. And remember, black expression evolves. It evolves with the times, with the terrain, with the region, with society, with everything. That does not mean the blues people gave up their traditional expression. That doesn't mean they turned their back on it. There are groups of black folk that disregarded many of our expressions from inception to it through its evolution for reasons that were suitable for them you know what have you but that doesn't mean 
when the music evolves, the people involved in it, the people it represents, and the people that are influenced by it, just toss the old or or, or the 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 prior one away. It still comes from the people. That's why it's folk music, because it's of the people, and it's the narrative told by the people. So what I say to all of you, you don't have to take my word for it, but what you do have to do is tell your narrative. I'll be rapping with y'all soon.